Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk, the most influential blog on education in the UK today. Uh, I'm not biased, but I'm delighted to be joined by Tom Rogers, one of my Twitter mates, and I'd like to unpick uh, his brain. Uh, I, I know a lot about his teaching experience, so I'll probably just, uh, we'll skim over that part just for people that might be new to Tom, uh, and we're going to unpick his work with Teachers Radio, Edudate, uh, so if you're single and looking for love, stay tuned, and... <laughs> uh, our views on toxic skills, and we'll we'll probably talk about Twitter at some point. Uh, so, Tom, uh, thanks for your time. Uh, how are you? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad, Ross. Uh, um, so, let's start with um, g- give us a little uh, historical overview of your teaching career to date. Uh, well, just in a nutshell, uh, qualified two thousand and eight, PGC two thousand and seven eight, and then since then I've I've worked as a teacher slash middle leader in 10, nine or 10 schools um, for varying different lengths of time. My first school was five years, the next yeah. one was two and a half and then two and a half. And then since then I've kind of gone for shorter term contracts. The last contract that I did was one year and it was a part-time mm-hmm. contract. That's as things that I've been doing on the side have got bigger or... yeah. Um, so you yeah. did a, you've done some work internationally. You've been Spain and Slovenia, was it? That's it. So I did Spain and I also did Slovenia. So Spain first, which was absolutely amazing. Um, just probably all around the, the just the best best experience. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and then yeah, went from there to Slovenia. Yeah, it wasn't such a good time, was it for you? No. Didn't... Um, Right, well, we'll we'll skip that chapter. But um, so you're in the northwest of England now. Uh, uh, yeah. Manchester or Liverpool? Where are you? Just moved to Manchester from uh, from Liverpool. So I was in Liverpool, moved to Manchester. So you know, 14 years teaching, and you're dabbling with lots of different side hustles, I suppose. So you uh, you've got Teachers Radio, Edgy Dates, and we'll talk about a few other things. But um. Tell us, um, tell us about how Edudate started. Was it so? Was it your idea looking for love, or, or was it a bit more than that? <laughs> well, at the time, I was pretty depressed and, and pretty single, to be fair. Um, so, I, no, I mean, it didn't. Re- so, when, in December twenty nineteen, I was like, I remember, I, I kind of like was toying with the idea of. I, I just was intrigued by this idea of setting up a speed dating event for for teachers i thought it was a cool idea i thought it was it would be fun it would be a laugh so in in december of 19 i was looking at like uh i was in leicester at that time i was teaching in leicester and i was like oh Mm. why don't i just run this event over christmas and i was looking at some a venue and whatever and whatever and it never really materialized but i kind of set up an event bright page as like a draft and whatever and i was like oh yeah Mm. this would be cool this would be but it was uh, literally just going to be a laugh really and yeah. then, uh, and then I kind of got distracted by other things. And then, and then obviously the pandemic happened in the March. By that time, I was teaching in Blackpool, and it kind of got to the April or May or whatever it was. And and my contract in Blackpool was due to finish anyway in the June. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the May, it was either the April or May. I was just like sat there, and I thought, oh. What about that speed dating idea that I had? But like, let's do it virtual. Yeah. So I just like put out a tweet as you do, and it was like, oh, why don't we do this, do this, and then it got a lot of interest. Okay. And um, and then I thought, okay, like I'll I'll make it a really simple speed dating format. And initially, it was just people using WhatsApp, and then obviously, um, it was a case of people would have these dates, people would match at the end of it, and. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I think the key to it was calling it edgy date because it was just funny. I think it create it created. Yeah, uh... I mean, I'm, I'm flicking through the website now as we talk, and it's um, you know, it, it, it says what it is on the tin, and you've got your three pound lucky dip and priority and all those types of things. So, um, how many people are dabbling with the dating on your site? So at the moment, there's so in total, there's five thousand people who have signed wow. up for edgy date. Um, now, obviously, a lot of it, as with, I guess, I'm not an expert on online dating websites, but I would presume that 
the membership is intermittent because you've got people who are single and then they're not single and then they're single and so on and so forth. Yeah. So in terms of active users, it's quite difficult to calculate that, but I would suggest that it would definitely be in the, in the hundreds of people who are in get, still engaging with EduDate um, yeah, on, I mean, on a again, regular the basis. The goal is you want to bring people as a platform for teachers who might be looking for someone interested in education, but I guess if I'm a member for 10 years, it's not a good endorsement, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have got success stories in the sense of like um, one member of EduDate contacted me would have been about three, four months ago now and said, oh, we're expecting a baby, um, right, which is amazing. quite exciting. And that, that baby's due, I think, next month. So that's right, interesting. That's a good success story, yeah. And then there's other ones who've moved in together, who, you know, other couples who I met a couple actually uh, for the first time face to face um a couple of months right. back and that was that was nice um, so are you doing all this yourself or have you got a little team to help you so at the moment i've well i've been doing it completely on my own uh up until about three months ago when i uh, brought someone else on to kind of help me out a little bit mm -hmm. uh just with because the thing is i've always been crap at data and um spreadsheets and databases yeah, okay. <laughs> and all that kind of stuff which is obviously very very important with something like edudate um so i mean i mean i was managing it myself uh up until then like i had a little bit of help off my girlfriend at various points yeah. but essentially it was me and then uh yeah so the last three so, months um, I guess so the last question you know i'm a married man so i'm not looking for a date but um how does the you know obviously you log in you look for people but the actual physical event you organize what what does that look like for people listening describe it to me so in the last two to three months we're transitioning from running the online events into now where you have the more traditional galleries on there whereby okay. you would have galleries with profiles and then you can click on a profile and you can send that person an instant message right so that's that's where we transition trans uh, transition to, but we are still going to run events. So we've got like an online portal yeah. where like we're going to have like video and text events and all these kind of things. But we haven't run one yet, so it'll be okay. interesting to see how and that I, goes. I guess I've got my final uh, kind of school leader type question, I suppose, from an, an egg tech perspective, or just in general, maybe uh, something you've already considered. But safeguarding, how do you? protect the right and wrong people signing up you know what what if i'm a bit of a i've yeah. got a bit of a dark side and uh you know whatever else uh, what, what kind of protocols have, have you got in place so there's three things really the first thing is when people sign up they have to verify their account by um, including a link to another social media account which is I mean, usually we ask for a professional one, so LinkedIn, for example, yeah. and then uh, that's and quite a good way initially. Yeah, collecting credit card details and stuff like that, I suppose. So, so at the moment with the galleries, the galleries are only open to priority members, which means there's payment verification, um, and all the priority galleries are password protected. So anonymity, right from the word go, has been an absolutely crucial issue for me because I know when I very first started, there was some questions criticisms online as you, as you get when you start anything to be fair especially on edgy mm -hmm. twitter but you know there were people saying oh this could happen so i actually thought very carefully about that in terms of like how to do that so now we've transitioned for example away from the exchange of phone numbers um so no one has to exchange a phone number with another person it's all automated it's all on mm -hmm. edgy day via edgy day via yeah. the website um, but the verification, there's payment verification, there's social media verification, and also there is a, um, so there's, it's, even though we've got 5,000 members, a proportion of those members, I ask for um, a photograph of their ID. Mm -hmm. So they okay. have to actually so... provide, they have to actually provide, but to, to be honest, when you're doing it yourself and it's, and it's more a manual process, you can, and you've been on social media long enough to know as well, is when you 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 start to pick up the warning signs, you know. Yeah, and plus yourself. it's a big job to, for you to be doing on your own, full stop. And while you're still teaching, it's a uh, uh, significant work pressure. I will know. Uh, let let's swap to teachers' radio. 
so it does uh, give us a 30 second lift pitch what is it um how can people get involved if they're not sure about it Teachers Talk Radio, biggest audio platform for teachers in the UK. Uh, 50, 50 plus people involved, 30 plus volunteer hosts. Um, it is voluntary. Um, the hosts uh, all have their own shows. Uh, they produce content that's available live and as a podcast. I think that's what's unique about Teachers Talk Radio is all the shows are live. We do have some recorded segments but 90% plus of what's there is happening when you're hearing it. Um, the, yeah, the aim really is to inform, it, it's to entertain, it's to offer analysis, it's to offer things that are happening now, unlike a podcast that might be recorded and then it might come out a week or two weeks later or whatever it is. Teach Talk Radio is there, it's in the moment, it's happening and it allows perhaps a, a slightly different medium. So uh, obviously well. it's topical, provocations, yeah. you know, all that type of stuff. Yeah. Um, and the host, you know, d generates their own agenda, I guess, to to draw in their own viewers and or listeners, I should say. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, I mean, the host can control the content that they want to put out and they want to talk about. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've been part of it myself and uh, I, I listen to it when I can. So you've got all the jingles, uh, you know, who, who's the person doing all the voiceovers and all the so that's great. audio? That's our Graham, uh, Graham Collum, who is a, a voice, a voice uh, he's actually a mate from uni, who I went to uni right. with. So uh, I knew he was a voiceover artist when I started Teachers Talk Radio. So I, so last February I was like, oh, do you fancy doing... And he he did it, and he's yeah he's well. So they're all recorded, aren't they? Or, or I guess he's not sitting there doing it live. No, no, they're all recorded. The jingles <laughs> are recorded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wouldn't want to repeat that six times in ninety minutes. So is the is the show on twenty four seven pretty much? No. So there's a schedule. Um, I mean, obviously you can follow the podcast on Spotify or whatever, and you can get all the all the shows, mm. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, all of them, and you can listen to everything back. But there's a schedule. So at the moment, Monday to Friday, it's 11 a.m. till 12 midday. It's 4 p.m. Oh, sorry, 6 p.m. through to 10 p.m. So uh, 11 till 12 and then 6 till 10, Monday to Friday. Saturday and Sunday is slightly different, but yeah. And there's always room for another another host. There is absolutely room for another host. So not yeah, Ross, I'll, that I'm offering yet. I'll I'm, text I'm, you. I'll I'm, text you I'm after this. And... <laughs> right. Yeah. I want to. Uh, I want to stir your beans. I suppose. I want to talk about toxic culture. Uh, I want to talk about Ofsted, which I know will drive you a bit mad. And then we'll talk about the the, the highs and lows of Edge Twitter. So and then by then you'll be ready to. Uh, strangle me. So um, let's <laughs> talk about uh, toxic schools first. So we, we did an event a while ago, which is quite a popular one, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, in the pandemic, a lot of people coming online, I guess for a bit of solace or comfort, or it's not just me, all that type of stuff. Um, so tell us, you know, your, your own, I know you've got your own journey also. Uh, and I know you talk to a lot of people online. Uh, what are the kind of not so nice things about education that you see in here a lot? Mate, I could go on. I could go on for about an hour on that. Um, I mean, there's still huge issues with uh, uh, fault with with what are the kind of reoccurring things that keep coming up. Ones that you know are the most popular topics. I think a lot of it comes down to people being treated unfairly. People being treated as not human. Um, people being treated as robots or machines. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that seems to come up a lot and is reflected in the decisions that are made regarding different individuals or, or, or people within schools. And is it exclusive to maybe challenging schools or is it any type of school? No, no, no it's any, I, I mean, you know, like yourself, it's any type of school. The so-called outstanding mm -hmm. schools can be the most toxic schools in the world because the pressure for the teachers to produce and to, to keep going at the same rate as, as you know, the next person, it can be intense. So mm -hmm. it can, it can, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's purely about the culture and the environment in the school, the, the leadership, what they said, the way no school's perfect though. Like no, well, that's someone might, that. someone might sit there and say, oh, I work in a toxic school. I made like a grid. I don't know if you saw it of like, like circle thing, because I thought, you know what, the reason I made that is some people say, oh, I work in toxic school. Do you, what, what happened? 
da, da, da. Right, well, that's one instant. That's one instant that impacted you. But what's the bigger picture? Yeah, what's happening in the school? Thing, yeah, who, who else is it affecting? So I think that's important to distinguish. And even even poor experiences aren't doesn't necessarily make it a toxic school, you know. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's uh, helping. You know, I guess what the the graphic is you've got, and maybe we'll stick it on the podcast is there signposting that kind of cultural stuff. You know, not just a, a, maybe a one off bullying episode, but things that are a bit more institutional. Yeah, exactly. That, that yeah. group think behavior, maybe I'll behave this way because the head teacher expects me to do X, Y, Z, even though I don't really believe in that decision or definitely type of, uh, way of working. There is um, a cult, there is a cult like thing with it, isn't there? There's a bit of a cult like, you know, well, there are people in the system, you know, in any industry, not just teaching, but there are people that quite enjoy going off and telling someone off and mm. calling them out for whatever reason. Um, what, what advice would you have for maybe a teacher who thinks they might be in a, you know, they've seen your graphic, they think that's definitely me. I guess two key questions. What are your tips for them to survive and, and a tip for maybe moving on and, and kind of getting to another job? Um, I mean, really, the key thing for me would be move if you can and, and trust your gut. So if, if someone sat there for two weeks every single day, going, I am literally dreading going into this place tomorrow, then don't waste any more time. If you can, get out. Now, I think that, and I've, I talked about this in one of my online courses on teacher well-being, and one of the bits in there is about what to do if you're within the situation and you can't leave or can't get out. So how do you challenge toxicity from within, which is a more complex thing, which might involve taking notes, and making sure that you're recording every conversation or every event that happens, handwritten notes are fine with the dates and the conversation, maybe some quotes in there as well. And then mm -hmm. being able to take that after a month, after 30 days to the leader of the school or whoever the person you feel most comfortable going to is with a trusted colleague or a union rep, maybe, but you know, it could be a, just a trusted colleague and going there and challenging it, challenging it and saying, listen, I, this has to stop and this is why, here's, here's my evidence. And then obviously if they don't take that seriously and if they don't want to um, uh, do that, there are professional organizations that can help. And mm -hmm. you know, I'm not, I'm not being funny, but you'll have seen that, you know, that I have seen reports of employment tribunals in the last few years where people have left an organization, they've taken them to court or they've gone down that avenue and they've received a huge payout for damages caused by I, I think we've become institutionally in teaching used to certain mm -hmm. behaviors and certain practices that in the outside world, maybe in a legal, even in a legal sense, they would look at less kindly than, than we have normalized it to be within, within so the give, profession. Could you give us an example? So maybe expecting to, you know, writing reports, it's just a done thing that you're going to write two or 300 reports in a secondary school year but not necessarily be given time to do so. So it's assuming that you'll do those after school hours. Have you got another example perhaps? Um, I mean, yeah, I, I think um, being treated uh, differently to everyone else um, by the way you've spoken to or by the way uh, maybe timetabling or, you know, uh, it, I, it would have to be a combination of different things, wouldn't it? But being tar feeling like someone's being targeted, not feeling like, but being targeted, because it does happen. Mm -hmm. um, I think that and obviously being being funneled out of, of a job or being put under unnecessary pressure for no reason. It could be a whole number of things. It could be, you know, being asked to do X, Y, Z. It, 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 mm -hmm. it could be a whole number of things, really. Um, and you mentioned it's you know, institutionalized, I suppose, or it's become part of our DNA in, in some respects. I guess, you know, when I thought, when I think back about my leadership and perhaps your own, you very rarely get training for that job where you're in charge of other people. And there's lots of mistakes you'll make along the way until you refine your own uh, rhythm, your own style of doing things, your learned behaviors from other people. Uh, I guess my question is, um, if, if you thought that potential school leaders could receive some kind of formal training or qualification to become a leader, who would do it? What would it be? What would, what, what you know, what kind of things in this regard would it contain, um, 
to help kind of maybe break that chain? I mean, that's that's a key point, isn't it? I mean, I took on a TLR like a year or two in, which is actually pretty late nowadays for what people seem to be doing. It's like a month in, do you want to be ahead of the department? You know, yeah. and it's the I, I felt at that time out of my depth. You know, I, I was thrust into a team of 16 people, 17 people, because it was the skills curriculum for year seven that I was managing. And I had to run meetings with people who, who were like 20, 30 years my senior. Uh, some of them didn't want to teach what I was now leading. Uh, mm -hmm. and it, and I had to learn on the job with that and, you know, you make massive mistakes like, and that should, and then that makes you feel rubbish, but actually, yeah. if you'd have had the proper training, you, you'd have avoided those situations or it's a, pro bit well. of a, de it's a deficit model, isn't it really? It's not, um, I guess, you know, that, that keeps repeating itself and then, uh, we lose good people or suppose, or, or we leave with a bit of frustration that we can't do our job very well. Do you know what's funny though? We need we need more classroom teachers than we need leaders now. That's that's what we need. So yeah. why why are we promoting people so fast through this system? I know people want to well, move up, but yeah, we need some, alternative some skills. Are, yeah, some skills may be desperate to obviously fill a role and a responsibility. Um, all right, let's switch topics. Let's come to Ofsted now. So uh, give us your latest beef, I suppose, on our inspection what doc, watchdog. Um, there's no, I mean, I mean, I think that. I think the fact they did away with the whole emphasis on data was was a was a good thing. However, we're still in the same situation where we've got a two day inspection based on what curriculum maps, like conversations about the curriculum. Anyone can. Right, I'm not being funny, but if you've got the gift of the gab, and if you are. Um, if you are great at making lovely graphics and if you're great at using all the buzzwords, like, you know, all the classic, but I could write like 20 now from cognitive science that I could list out to you. If you're good at all those things, then I'm not being funny. That surely gives you a better chance in inspection. Is it right that that gives you a better chance? Absolutely not. It should be. It, and actually we could list a million different flaws about it. The contextual issues about it. I know Beth, Mary Baustead mentioned this in a book about how you know we're still in the situation even now where the more leafy school you work in the better chance you've got of getting a good Ofsted grade it's still happening so mm. people we, you know I know you've said this for years and, and many people have said this for years it's still happening it hasn't changed so why is that because I thought the whole curriculum drive was going to change that and suddenly you know we were going to start seeing um you know outstanding judgments for schools that that, that whose well, results I, I guess might you not take away well. if you, we take away the data conversation if my pupils in my leafy school are of a certain demographic they're potentially yes. also of a certain cultural capital yes uh, my current issue is if I, as an inspector, quiz the pupils, their work in memory and all that shebang, uh, the curriculum intention on paper is or isn't clear because the pupils can recall in that high stakes scenario. Now, if I've got a, low, a high or a low cognitive load and depending on what the inspector asks, I guess, uh, determines what's written on that report and what the inspector thinks about the curriculum uh outcomes i suppose so, so that intent implementation impact part there's um, all there's, there's there's lots of ways to manipulate cohorts and to present cohorts in certain ways um let, let's just switch back to the leadership conversation then so we've got a lot of potential toxic stuff going on i, I believe to be a often inspector to work in a certain type of school um, is there a, uh, what are your views on scope for Ofsted allowing school leaders who work in maybe RI or inadequate schools to become inspectors? Would that be a, well, I don't trust something. I'm the wrong, I'm the wrong person to ask cause I don't trust the gradings. So I couldn't care less if somebody, I couldn't care less if someone works in an inadequate or outstanding school. I'm the wrong person to ask. When I see celebrations with balloons and stickers and everything about Ofsted grades, it drives me nuts. So I'm the wrong person to ask. Because I, I, you you know, you can have you can have the best leader in the world working in an inadequate school. They have one dodgy inspection, and suddenly they're, they're there for five years working in a so-called rubbish school. Mm -hmm. So, so um, you know, yeah, you and I have been here uh, many times before. So I guess for listeners, you know, off, um, Tom and I are, are quite big advocates for you know challenging the reliability of Ofsted grades, I suppose. Um, 
So if I put you in a corner, is that the one thing you'd like to see fixed or is it something else? I think it would be a massive, if we could strip out the offset grades, I think it would be a huge step forward. Absolutely huge step forward. I think it would transform um, transform so much. I think it would it would lit overnight. And you know what? It costs no money. Yeah, it no, should just it would, be taken out. Have a big impact. Right, let's do what th one more controversial topic and then I'll go gentle and get your heart rate back slowing down. <laughs> right, let's swap to ed edgy Twitter. Give us some highs and lows of your edgy Twitter life to date. Uh, I mean, the highs is just the network that you can gain from it. The people that you meet, I wouldn't know you without Twitter. Um, mm. Just to put the, the huge opportunities for a anyone on there. I mean, if you have an idea or if you have some thoughts or if you have more than if you're creative, if you're a creative person, then what an amazing outlet for that. Um, you know, and I think the high would be that is the connections, the networks, the opportunities. Mm -hmm. The low is obviously that, you know, and you, I know you've experienced this is when people do stuff, whatever it is. I saw a tweet actually yesterday, two days ago from someone saying, Something like, oh, um, teachers who, uh, oh, I can see this person's come up with this and it's it's pathetic or whatever and, you know, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And all it was is an idea. Take it or leave it. If someone does mm -hmm. something, you don't like it, you don't have to buy in. You don't mm -hmm. have to engage. You don't have to. I think one of the low points for me is just hating on, is, is the hating on other people, other people's ideas, other people's success. Uh yeah, it's a tough one. I mean, I, I know, it, you know, in the earlier days of Twitter, I suppose, um, can ruin your weekend for sure. Um, I, I guess you've got to start filtering. You get hard into you, you do you get, get hard hard to it, though. I mean, me now, I, I'm just hard to it. I was chatting to someone a couple of months back and she was upset about something that had happened on Twitter. And, um, you know, she was really upset. And um, and she said to me, how, how, how do you do like, I said that what you've just shown me has been said to you, that to me is like one out of like 10 comments that might happen over a week or whatever, or a month, you mm. know? And if I had, and I probably would have, when I first started, I would have had that same reaction probably as this mm. person had. Um, so I guess but, the, but you the, get, you grow so hard to it. I don't know if that's right or wrong or a good thing or well, a bad that thing. That was the question. Was that, is it right or wrong? And you know, the, the status of the profession, how people use social media, you know, the... I mean, to be fair, you know, anyone can come across bad on Twitter because of the tone of, of, of it. You know, you, you write in text in limited a number of characters. So anyone can come across. I think the difference for me is where factually someone does or says something that is just, just terrible you know that's that's the difference for me anyone can be misunderstood anyone can you know write in a tone that some people don't like you know that's mm -hmm. not i mean that's that's any you know the same as people writing letters to each other sure so um obviously you were how long you've been on twitter now good 10 years getting close no no, no. 20 Less. 20 end of 2015 Right. Okay. And so you're well, seven years, not bad. It not bad innings. Um, yeah. So, um, <laughs> the, the wonderful world of Twitter, right. Let, let's switch to, uh, you know, you're a history teacher. We haven't talked about history. Tell us uh, why history and you know what you're into particularly. And, uh, you've got a, a history of uh, not a history. You've got a network of history teachers. Also that history icon stuff that you do. Yeah. So, uh, three questions. Uh, why history? Tell us what you're up to in particular topics of history on your teaching and then tell us about tm history icons i think it's called that's right um yeah no I've, i still love teaching history i still i still really enjoy it um i mean anything anything uh kind of 20th century is my bag um i'm not a massive fan of like the stone age um <laughs> so all, all the kind of curriculum redesigns of like oh let's bring in something about like how rocks were created I, I that doesn't inspire me but equally you know i think obviously i'm interested in history i'm interested in all history and i enjoy teaching it all uh, mm -hmm. but yeah anything 20th century is my kind of bag and then uh yeah tm history icons um is a grassroots teach me network obviously we've got other subjects as well to, on teach me icons if you just search for it yeah you got we've got 10 subjects on there now so is that um, uh, it's a teach me on a particular subject matter isn't it 
That's right. It's subject specific teach meets, essentially, and they're free and, for teachers to attend. And you do them all over the country or just in the northwest? So at the moment, the face to face events are in Manchester. Uh, if you go on the website, you can see we've got some upcoming. The next one's in September. It's the English one, which will be a big one. Uh, right. So low. So you're um, you're quite a busy man, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, it's. It, yeah, basically, yeah. Um, I mean, I finished my last teaching contract last week. So right. um, up until I was I was doing a teaching contract up until so last week. Next, and then, What's next for you then? Next I don't know. Year or so? I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I'm in a great position where I'm going to take on, I, I wouldn't take on a permanent full-time contract now at the moment because of my other mm -hmm. commitments. So, um, yeah, so I'm open. If anyone needs a... Uh, a history teacher for a few weeks in the northwest from september then give me a shout right there you go right um so we're well past my 20 minute barrier which is a uh, good go we've got lost in our conversation but at the end of my show i like to just ping loads of if you're old enough tom to remember timmy mallet you know don't pause or hesitate um i'm gonna ping things your way and see how you get on so we'll start easy um so what what you're working on today before we spoke uh, Edge Day Teachers Talk Radio. Okay, uh, what book are you reading for fun? Uh, non, don't read for fun, only read non-fiction. Right, what are you reading? Uh, nothing. I'm reading the screen <laughs> right now um, that says R Riverside and has your face on it. Teacher okay. Talking. Um, if I was Education Secretary of State, I would... Finish the sentence. Um... Make a teacher the education secretary, so resign yeah, myself so, uh, and give uh, it to uh, someone uh, else. Uh, mm. What would be your dream job? So if you if you wasn't a history teacher or wasn't a, a data or a radio I'll be honest radio with you, I've got I've got the dream job, which is a combo of history teacher slash all the other stuff, the creative right, stuff. Right, you're living the doing. dream. Okay, yeah. biggest career achievement to date. Oh goodness me. Um, Probably, probably continuing to be a teacher in year 14, year 15. Okay, that's pretty good. If we went to Valencia together for 24 hours, what would we do? What would we see? Oh, amazing. Uh, tapas, Australia, Galicia, uh, Spanish people. Yeah, it'd be amazing. Right, be, be, uh, Brit be Britain every time. Yeah, carry on. <laughs> uh, right, uh, who would you recommend I interview next and why? Oh, God. Um, Come on, you know lots of people. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of think of someone who I find interesting and why. Let me think. Let me think. Oh God. Um, do you know what? I can't pick one person. I, there's so many right. I could pick. I might come back to that. Right. If I was, if um, uh, Back to edgy date. Have you have you managed to secure a successful date yourself? I I have a girlfriend, so I've I've been <laughs> with her now for. Um... Did you meet on edgy date? No, no, she's not a teacher. She works in HR. Right. Okay. Well, I was trying to get you a ringing endorsement there for edgy date. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, this might be a controversial one for you, but what's your favourite radio show on your teacher's radio? I, I was. Got one. I thought. I wish you'd ask. What's my favourite radio station? Because it's Teachers Talk Radio. It's my favourite teacher show radio that you station. like listening to, or is that putting you in a corner? Uh, I, I'll be honest. There's a hell of. I, I I enjoy them all for different reasons, and that's a genuine answer. <laughs> good answer. Good answer. Uh, right. Uh, let Let me finish uh, with a big one then. So, you know. In many years' time, what would you hope to be your legacy, I suppose, as, as an educator doing all these different things? I, I don't really, I, I, I don't really think about my, my leg. I haven't really thought about that, if I'm honest with you. I, I just want to enjoy what I'm doing, carry on working hard, carry on trying to make a difference in whatever way I think is the best or I enjoy doing the most or whatever, and then see, see where that leads. Yeah, I mean, you've got um, your Twitter, you're on 51 plus uh, thousand followers. So you've got a little army of people that are interested in what you're doing and what you're saying. So that's um, that's a little bit of an impact there. Um, and I'm I sure guess. you're on your if other you... channel. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we know Twitter can be a little bit fickle, but you, you, you're you doing, you know, the radio show is a great success. The, the dating stuff yeah. I saw you got it picked up in the in the press when it came out. 
So you're definitely moving mountains and I guess, you know, those side hustles give you a bit of autonomy and allow you to um, stay away, I suppose, from that toxic stuff, which I know has scarred you once or twice uh, and you're still dabbling with it. Or I guess I guess it would it be fair to conclude that you're a, a, a looking for love in terms of the right school. Um, yeah, to, I, I think, time role yeah, history, that yeah, type of stuff. yeah, 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 I think that's fair to say, although, you know, I'll see how everything develops. I just don't know what's going to happen in the next year or two. Anything going to happen. Well, we might put the podcast then, Looking for Love in History as, as a podcast title. So we'll see. Right, Tom, it's been great to catch up with you. All right, Thank you nice for one. all your time. Uh, have a, well, I might see you Saturday, you never know. Um, and um, uh, have a good summer, if not. Uh, thanks for your Cheers. time. Cheers, mate. All right. See you later. Cheers, Tom.